Worcester, that's right, kid. The, the Aku Aku spent many, many years <laughs> out there doing gigs. Right? Yeah, I, that was a while ago when they used to have uh, the comedy gigs out there. and, and the, That's right. They had my little classic uh, Pac-Man cocktail table. I'd sit down with some uh, <laughs> some uh, some ribs, some spare yep. ribs, yep. <laughs> play Pac-Man and wait for my spot. Nice. Have a couple of Mai Tais, get loose. Oh, actually, you don't drink, right? You don't drink. I don't drink. Right, I don't right, drink. Right, okay. I certainly would watch people walk around yes. with those <laughs> giant cavernous bowls. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we'll we'll talk about the the Wang Theater in a sec, but I need to fact check some things with you. Okay. Uh, uh, first, uh, um, did you actually do seven hours of stand up, and is that a world record? Not a world record. Okay. Um, that was a Laugh Factory record only. The world record, I honestly think there was a guy in London who I heard stood on stage for like forty hours straight. Oh my god! I mean, did you do seven hours without repeating anything? Seven hours. The, the whole gig was seven hours. The 49 people that were in the audience, uh, of, of the 49, uh, at 7 in the morning when the show ended, I believe 44 <laughs> were remaining. And wow. I just talked to every single person. So I would talk to people, and then I would roast your life. It was almost like therapy, but your therapist is a comedian <laughs> and going to make fun of every... <laughs> you know, every, uh, you know, thing that you share, I was like going to come back with some retort that was funny. So it was seven hours. It was material. And when I finished my material, it was, all right, I'm going to know everybody in this audience right. by the time I leave the stage. Right. Like eight, like four hours of crowd work, right? <laughs> <laughs> At least. Yeah, yeah. No, at two in the morning, I gave somebody, I, I think I had a hundred dollar bill in my back pocket from the club saying, oh, we owed you from a couple of sets. And I handed it to some kid, and I said, go over to that McDonald's and get everybody here burgers and fries. Oh, nice. And uh, I bought the whole audience. That's <laughs> awesome. We just, like, sat around. And, yeah, it was a lot of yapping, but I did stand. I never sat. I never sat oh, on the stool. God. And I never left to use the restroom either. So oh, it God. was an official seven hours of stand-up at the Laugh Factory. That's insane. That's incredible. I mean... At least, like, if someone, like, say, at the, the cellar or, or the store or something, like, if everybody cancels, they're like, call Dane. He has a tight seven hours he could fill in. With. <laughs> right? I, don't know if, I don't know if anybody would have said tight, uh, but they would have <laughs> identified that I had some time I could fill. Right. And the other thing I wanted to fact check is, did you actually kiss Charlize Theron's ass? I did. Oh, my God, dude. Was not planned. I think some people thought it was a skit. Um, no, she came out there. She had a couple of drinks backstage, so she was she was excited. She was, uh, you know, kind of up for anything, and and you could tell that she loved stand up. And the moment just kind of took us away. And uh, but when when I was there, when I was about to put a smooch on her derriere, I was oh. like, I'm I'm gonna go for it. I'm I'm going in. Right? It's not every week. Why not? Yeah, not <laughs> it's not every week. It's Charlize they're on, you know, putting it out there for you. So yeah. <laughs> You got to do it, the, right? The photo of that is, I would have to say, in my top five favorite moments of my career. Whenever somebody <laughs> finds that and shares it and says, what the hell is this? Mostly because of the laugh on her face and how much fun she was having with that moment. That's awesome, man. That is, that's, just, <laughs> that's just hilarious. I mean, you know, it's a long way from Arlington High School. To, oh, my uh, gosh. I cannot tell you how many times I've probably said that in this... Uh, you quite wild ride, man. This amazing career that I thought is it going to last a year, two years, right? And here it is, thirty years later, and coming back to Boston to celebrate it with everybody with another big gig back there, and and to be filming it. Um, you know, started there, did my first big HBO special in '05 there at the Garden, and now to be coming back and playing, you know, the Wang Theater is just it's awesome. Yeah, that's the, so. This is uh, you haven't taped a special in a long time. Like, yeah, no, no. <laughs> this is uh, this is everything that's been cultivate. Well, I was I did a tour. The Tell it Like It Is tour was before COVID, and what that was, it was like, okay, here's some new material that I want to tour, and a chunk of it's going to be on my next special, and then there was a little chunk of it from the year before. So I was like, all right, that's about you know an hour and twenty minutes of stuff from two tours. And then the pause from COVID, and then, of course, this year I've been performing all year, once mm -hmm. we were allowed to. So now the show has actually become three, you know, unique, uh, you know, months of new material that 
now I'm, now I'm scratching my head going, I don't know exactly what I want to do because I, I've got a plethora of ideas here. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, it's, it's amazing. I, I guess, I mean, not just, so much has happened. How can you not, like, alter that, you know, alter what you had planned, uh, you know, originally going in? I mean, unless you go in with that original set, not even mention COVID. I mean, I guess that could be something. Yeah, I'm staying away from it only because I think that I've always been a, a you know, as a, as a storyteller, as somebody who likes, you know, LPMs and laughs per minute in my, in my storytelling, for me, stuff that's like news of the day was always going to be funniest in, in a great monologue or by a John Stewart, you know, or now like a Colbert. I never got really into anything that was so like news of the day because what are you going to say and work on for a month that somebody hasn't said hilariously in one of those monologues on any given night? So my observing and reporting, thankfully, I didn't have to adjust it. I just had to continue to work on, you know, here's some stories. And, and by the way, the stories that I put together for this show, a lot of it is, you know, here's some high water marks and some, you know, self-deprecating lows in my life and career that really unfolded because of, of stand-up. So I, I'm excited for people to see it because it's a lot of, um, I don't know if I can say holy S moments sure. um, that uh, have, you know, made up what this routine is. It's, it's, it's exciting, and I can't wait to, you know, finally, fingers crossed, share it. Yeah, you you were one of the first to uh, to really utilize social media way back in the day uh, uh, to get to kind of get you out there with with MySpace and stuff. And now it seems like social media, while it's still a great promotional tool, has become a dangerous place for comedians, especially kind of like a minefield. Right? Um, how how do you uh, like how do you see that from going from the MySpace days to now? Right? Like, what have you observed? Oh, man, in that? it's, it's era yeah it's um you know i was in the you know wild wild west of the internet age where for a number of years nobody was looking at a comment section nobody cared a lot about what somebody else was responding because it was just so incredible to have this portal to the musicians and the the directors and the comedians that we that we loved there was a, a handshake digitally uh, and for a number of years, that's, that was, uh, I think, before celebrity became um, maybe less about the time put in as a painter, as a thespian, as a comedian, as a whatever, I think it became more about just celebrity for the sake of celebrity. So that you know, definitely mm-hmm. changed the dynamic of, of you know, respect, of uh, entitlement, a number of things. It just shifted. I, I, I watched it because I was at the you know throes of it in the beginning and reveling in it, and then I did see what happened when that comment section started being weaponized, and what happens when a group of people that are anti you decide I'm in the mood to pig pile. Who's right. who's on one knee right now? Yeah, um, I was I I went through every enchanting moment of that. <laughs> with yeah, the internet. it was like I had. I had the moments where I couldn't believe what was being written or said. And by the way, some of these things I do touch on even in the, in the stand-up. You know, it's like one year I was dating Rihanna. The Internet said it. <laughs> everyone believed it. I never met her. I think I met her. I think I waved at her at a comedy show, and she went, I had fun tonight. I, w- I said, hi, nice to see you. And then that was it. And for a year, I had people calling me in the media. and Are you secretly with her? Okay. <laughs> the next year, I was apparently dead. I had died in a cliff diving accident in Costa Rica. So I, I also know what it is to have died because people were writing me and, oh, my God, please say you're okay. And, and these beautiful texts and letters and, you know, my fans, you know, I'm writing on my, hey, guys, I, I'm fine. You know, this is a bullshit article. And, um, and of course, uh, you know, people, the clickbait of it all. Right. This yeah. era now, man, is like sorry to be long winded on no, it, but no, this era now is even trickier because you've got all all of that stuff which it lends itself to you know, the hyperbole gets away from you, mm-hmm. the narrative gets hijacked from you, you know, you gotta kind of you're on your own ride with a, a figment of yourself that uh some of it 
is traces of you, and some of it is, is you know, nobody has spoken the words. A, 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 a quote, source has spoken words that, you know, that uh, suddenly make up your narrative. And then you add to that a young comedian who wants to get out there, and they want to rattle the cage, and they want to, you know, talk, you know, say some shocking stuff. And unfortunately, with cameras and audio people, you know, audio taping, it's just not the time right now to push things so far because, unfortunately, second chances are few and far between right now. Yeah. Two, two things on, on what you just said there. One, you got to experience something uh, a lot of people, I guess, don't get to, and that is people thinking you're dead and then, t- and then expressing things like their love for you or their admiration for you. You wouldn't really hear that otherwise, I guess. Like you kind of went to your own funeral and saw who showed up. And then, right. but then, you know, was there anybody that was like, oh my God, he was such a, a, a great comedian and artist and a wonderful man and stuff. Oh, well, actually he's not dead. Oh, well then I take back everything I said. <laughs> you know, <is> oh, it- <laughs> I, I know that there, if I look back, there has to be some, for my comedy friends especially, I think I got some <laughs> fake obituaries. Oh, great. <laughs> great. I think I got some obituaries that were just like, I, I can't even repeat my own reaction to it, but. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of yeah. people had a lot of fun at my uh, expense for that. Yeah. But I also do remember there was a little like that little ray of sunshine of like I think I think people would miss me. I really right. feel like right? yeah. some people yeah. got so sad in like when I saw this art. I know you're okay now, but I, I, I in case if something <laughs> ever happened, I want you to know. And I started getting you know, really passionate (laughs) letters and emails. And so, um, yeah, I think one person said, did you, did you, um, plant that article just to, you know, get some, get some, uh, you know, true tender love and support, which we don't often get on the internet. I said, no, I'm not that smart. Oh, that's just brutal. That's like, first of all, they made something up about you out of thin air. And then someone accuses you of, of being you. Yeah. Oh oh, man. Come on. Uh, Every, (laughs) Every strange alley of the internet, uh, except for the dark web, I have experienced, and I'll tell you, it is, um, it's, it's a, it's one of the wildest elements of the whole career is the the PR side of it and how that goes, where something is written, and you know, you get a phone call from a PR person, and it's like. What do we do? Uh, nothing. Because if we start trying to like fight a lie, it looks we- and you kind of just watch this thing happen, this storm that's around you, and uh, and yet you're like, I can't really answer to it because it's not real. It's so weird. It's very strange. Yeah. It's like being forced to be a character instead of like participating in playing a character. If suddenly I just there was an article about you today, and it was so wildly fantastical and inaccurate that you're like, Dane, I wouldn't even know where to start correcting this. I don't even know where I would start untying this knot. And that's the internet. And that's yeah. certainly being in the public eye in the internet. You just got to kind of go with it. There's you and then there's the internet you. Right, right. I mean, the internet and social media, to me, it's just, it's like high school. You know, someone says one thing, and then by the time, it, you know, you get to sit down at lunch in the cafeteria, you know, you killed Kennedy, and, right. you know, everything, it's, it's yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it is like high school. In fact, I find myself pausing to play some hacky sack in the quad from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so you, I, I, I was reading some interviews, you were saying you're going to be doing some stuff uh, at the, uh, the shows at the Wang near the end of the month here. Uh, that you you were saying visually are going to be different. Uh, mm-hmm. That a lot you think a, a lot of people, comedians, especially watching this, will say, "Hey, now that's that's how comedy on TV should be done." Can you can you give us a hint about anything? Uh, any details yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say I don't. I, I certainly don't think comics are going to say, uh, you know, that's how comedy should be delivered. I think if anything, they'll say that's an aesthetic that is going to probably. Um, be necessary in terms of you know the the environment we grew up, you know we're in a TikTok generation uh I grew up in the you know MTV generation what did that mean that meant you know quicker cuts that meant uh you know um you know stylistically you know mm-hmm. it's, you had to start thinking about you know 
uh, how you wanted your presentation to be just beyond like the story that you uh, had put together. And so I had worked over the years on you know specials that my creative crew did that. You know, Vicious Circle, the whole idea was not only to capture an arena in the round, but you know, to light it a certain way so that the audience was essentially the, the, the curtain that normally would be behind the comic's head. I wanted the curtain to be alive, a, you know, a, a wall of people. That's why I lit the crowd, and, and my producers and I figured out a way to shoot the garden, you know, in a way that uh, I would feel like uh, it would be a dynamic visual experience. The comedy's funny, the, you know, not everything ages great, you know, maybe mm-hmm. the jeans aren't right now or the hair looks, <laughs> but at least if it's got something that, um, you know, gives it some pizzazz, then you could possibly be uh, standing the test of time as a visual, you know, medium. Uh, there's a lot of bad comedy specials. There's ones that, you know, don't look good out of the gate, and they certainly are not watchable a couple of years later. What does that mean to the funny comedian? What does that mean to the great content that might be hilarious, but uh, doesn't fit in anymore with the look of today? Right. Um, and so my goal there was I, I wanted to come up with a, a palette and, uh, and a theme, as I love themes. I always love coming up with the great title and the, you know, where I'm at in my life and everything around it, and the title has to represent really, you know, where I'm at. It's kind of like a journal. And with this, um, working with some uh, really innovative people on the tech side of things to give some layers uh, to a comedy special that I think just will be more appealing. And I think it's funny. I think stand-up used to be the most dynamic thing you could see on TV. It was so different. It went from click, click, click to, you know, you're clicking through the channels, and then suddenly there's one person standing in a spotlight, and that, like, what a downshift to everything else, produ- you know, produced. Right. Um, and for a while, I felt like that was the, the, the most dynamic and coolest thing you could see. And now, because television has grown exponentially, and it's, it's, it's theater quality at home, and productions are multi, multi-million dollars, and the post, you know, colorizations, and the score, the music... It's surpassed stand up to where now I think that there's a lot of stand up that you watch and it feels dull, even though it's still a gifted performer. So I want to give it a little razzmatazz so that uh, hopefully as years go by, it will continue to, you know, be a, a great visual experience as well as if you're just, you know, listening to it somewhere on a, on a headphone. And who, who, do you, who do you see these days who's doing stuff? I don't want to say like that, but who, is, who are who's breaking barriers as far as the whole presentation of stand-up comedy? Like, who's the first well, person that comes uh, to mind? Well, you know, I love Dave Chappelle. And uh, I think yeah. that Dave, if you look at any of his Netflix specials, if you look at what Dave does even live, you know, there's a lot of thought in, into the, 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 the visualization that goes with the story he's trying to create. You know, there's a theme. Mm-hmm. There's, and so I think Dave is still at the, the forefront of that. But I also have to say that, um, let's see, let me, let me say this without, you know, patting myself on the back. Maybe I'll just gently rub myself on the back. <laughs> I love that a lot of people ended up in the round, and I love that a lot of the look that I created with Marty Kulner in that period really did set kind of a, a bar. Yeah. Um, there was a time when people would say, oh, those arena shows, it's a, it's a circus, and that's not really comedy, and, and, and yet, some of those same people—that's the—that's sh- the look of their show. It's right. in the round, you know. It's the screens up, you know, over the the boxing ring rig over your head. And when I see another version of that, not only am I just flattered and proud that you know myself and Marty Culner came out and and uh, turned the page on on what you know a comedy event can look like, but it makes me even. Um, more enthused to do the next one because I know I'm on to something and I think that it'll be uh, nice to see other people's interpretation of it. Cool. Interesting. So uh, during this time of, uh, of COVID, when things were heaviest, like last year, when you had to cancel, were you doing, like a lot of people did the Zoom shows, a lot of people did the drive-in shows, uh, stuff like that. Were you, were you branching out and trying to do anything like that? So I know some comics I talked to were like, I had nothing to do with that. You know, like I talked to uh, uh, Don Gavin recently, yep. and he was just like, "No way, I'm not doing that." You know, I'm not right. gonna. Yeah, <laughs> it's not my. Yeah, game. yeah. I, 
I personally didn't want to do that because, you know, outside shows anyway are pretty difficult. Sound dissipates, you know, cars honking horns. And right. uh, I, I wasn't enthused about that. I only did a couple of outside shows probably right near the very end of the quarantine simply because they had grown into great setups. A couple of shows in and around L.A. that turned into um, very popular comedy nights, and, and they figured out a way to do the, the sound and the lights and the look so that it wasn't uh, intrusive and, and it lent to the show. So I think I did two, but not till the very end. I spent the whole year pretty much working on writing, working on some of the prep for the special. And then I also had taken that fun little sidestep where I put together the Fast Times at Ridgemont High read yes. with Brad Pitt and yeah. uh, a cavalcade of stars. So that was pretty pretty wild, but that took me several months to uh, to organize that. That was one of the hardest things I'll ever do in my life, was putting those people together on a Zoom. I can't even imagine what it's like to wrangle that many people at that level because it's, it's the scheduling and what they're doing. and yeah. uh, But it really, I thought it came out great because I'm a huge fan oh, of yeah, that movie. Yeah. And it, it was it just was, a lot of I fun. I didn't think it would ever work. I mean, honestly, there were literally, literally, literally eight times over the course of months where it... it it just fell apart. It was impossible. It was impossible. And in fact, one time I finally talked to um, Sean, Sean Penn, and I said, I can't do this. <laughs> Every time I get three people, somebody else, I said, this is not going to work with the kind of caliber I want. And I, and I, and I do want something that will, nobody will ever forget. So I don't want to do anything less. And I just can't. And he was the, <laughs> he was the one who was like, don't give up. Don't quit on this. I know we can get this done. You know, he, he really did talk me off the ledge at the one time where I finally was like, all right, six times this fell apart. Sean, I, I, I'm going to let you down. I'm going to let myself down. It is not coming together. And then, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, gave me those, uh, he gave me those Sean Penn eyes. And I said, all right, all right, I'll go back to work. <laughs> Sean Penn eyes. Ooh. <laughs> he's intense, man. I'm not going to lie. Sean Penn is like, he's, you know, that's a guy that, like, when he looks at you and he says, we're going to take that hill, you're like, I've never shot a weapon. Give me a weapon. I'm ready. <laughs> awesome. Spicoli kept it all together in the end. That's he fantastic. Did. He really did. <laughs> so do you have any, uh, like, aside from the, the taping of these shows, do you have any other film work? that you're looking at or, or television work that you're working on, maybe not in front of the camera, behind the camera, stuff like that? Yeah, I've got some things that I've, I've written. I, I started a side company with my friend Monib. We did uh, uh, a short film that went up for Oscar qualification. So now we're kind of dabbling in the production side, and I've got some great investors. So if I come up with the right story with the right people, we've got some a little bit of money to put into you know, storytelling, one way or another, whether it's stand-up or, or behind the camera or, or, you know, sometimes the phone rings and somebody goes, hey, you know, American Typecast or, or Mr. Brooks, and mm. I'm, I'm mm. game and gung-ho, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that right now the world is still healing and it's, it's, it's hard to get anything off the ground. Yeah. So I will certainly look forward to the day when things start to feel like uh, they're back in some kind of normal momentum i do hope we get there sooner than later but uh, in the meantime it's it's all stand up all the time all right well dane i i appreciate you checking in man and uh, it's the wang theater 29th and 30th uh and they're taping the show and i'm really interested the way you described it now i'm i'm really interested to see how how this is going to come out so uh, i appreciate you taking the time man thank you so much for checking oh, man, in this was a great chat and uh i look forward to uh many many more yeah, well, I hope you, you can stop by uh, Worcester. We don't have the Aku Aku anymore, but there's plenty of other <laughs> equally as seedy places you can do a solid seven hours. So, uh, <laughs> All right, so. you got it. <laughs> All right, Dane. Hey, thanks a lot, Thank man. Thank you so much.